architecture. Uh, hello again, my name is Matthew Yakov. I'm a system engineering manager of the Special Ops team. And today we're going to talk in details about the unified security and in your SASE infrastructure. As it was previously stated, each of the Versa OS devices, which are used on all of the components in our SASE infrastructure, contains various security features such as cloud access security broker, data less prevention, remote browser isolation, and so on and so forth, feature rich security function, uh, SD WAN function functionality, and of course, carrier grade routing functionality, which allows you to do a lot of stuff, including uh, things such as multi protocol BGP. We support the EV4, IPv6, we support multicast, we support EVPN, and a lot of other things as well. But anyway, where this all is going to be used? If we're going to go on the next slide, this is a brief topology of the Versa SASE infrastructure. In here, you can see SASE Cloud Gateway uh, Cluster. You can also see your data sensors, which have Versa OS devices, and you can see remote users or maybe work from home users, which are using SASE clients, which were shown in the previous se sessions. And also you can connect your uh, legacy infrastructure to be protected by the Versa SASE cloud gateways. In all of these places, like in all the cloud gateways, in all of the on-prem devices, we're using absolutely the same operating system. There is no difference. It's just the different uh, hardware or different virtual infrastructure on which it's going to be deployed. But now, what this gives us, what this unification of the operating system, what functionality it will give us. Let's review in a little more details the template structure which Versa Networks has. First of all, we have a construct which is called device groups. Device groups can contain uh, from one to maybe hundreds of devices. And also device group can contain multiple templates. For example, each of the device groups will contain information about what kind of template is gonna be used, which will dictate which ports are gonna be used, uh, what are the main services that are gonna be running on that device and so on. Usually there is only one device template on each of the device groups. But then we have another type of templates, which is called service templates. And those service templates can be mixed and matched. For example, you can have next generation firewall policy, which can be applied to the device group, which works for your data center branches. The same template can be applied to your uh, device group, which is working for the uh, branch offices. And the same can be applied to your SASE gateways, which is going to be applied to your remote users, which are connecting remotely uh, from their home offices or maybe roaming uh, somewhere from the field and so on and so forth. So this allows us to unify uh, security policies across multiple devices or across the whole infrastructure and uh, and configure it in a single place. Configuration using service templates allows us, first of all, do the simplification because you need to configure it once. Second, it uh, allows you to avoid mistakes because by configuring it in one place and not configuring in multiple different uh, places, you will make sure that all the configuration is consistent across all of the devices. You mentioned at the top of the uh, of this particular section around that you support IPv4 and IPv6. Is that supported both in the underlay and the overlay? So you could handle an IPv6 transport as well as uh, in, in the underlay, so the physical connectivity from either the internet or uh, like an MPLS connection or something? Not only is it supported in the underlay and overlay, we also support combinations of underlay. For example, you can have some links over with IPv6 in the underlay and some links in IPv4 in the underlay, and they can work simultaneously to build tunnels. And also you can have simultaneous IPv4 and IPv6 in the overlay, as well as multicast is also supported, and it's going to be also IPv4 and IPv6. So yes, all of this supported. Thank you. Um, just a clarification question. It's Justin here. Um, the devices that you're applying these templates to, is this just the endpoint devices or is this also gateway devices? Uh, this is all of them. This is gateway devices and endpoint devices. Okay. So once again, going back to this slide, here are the gateways. Here are the endpoint devices, like on the edge. All of them are using the same operating system and all of them can have the same template applied to them. Are they... Uh completely different, like the de device templates and, and service templates? Is there any settings that are the same? And if so, is there a hierarchy of uh, which settings get applied if there's a Very collision? Very good question. Let me actually demonstrate it. 
So we're going to use this same verse director, which we used in the previous section. So if we're going to go in the configuration, we're going to see device group configuration. In the device group configuration, for example, I have this SASE device. And here I have the list of the templates which are going to be applied. So I can, first of all, mix and match them. I can rearrange them in which order they are going to be applied. If there's any kind of or pieces of configuration which are intersecting with each other, the last one applied will take over. I mean, in majority of the cases, they're not intersecting, but even if there is something like, uh, I don't know, um, technically you can define the same policies in multiple next generation uh, firewall templates because you can apply uh, two or three or four or even more different uh, next generation firewall templates to the same device group. And uh, if some configuration is intersecting, you can just define in which order they are going to be applied. So the last one will take precedence. Okay, now about the templates. So here are the templates which we have. We have device templates, which are applied for individual devices and one per device group. We have service templates where we have uh, templates of different types. So it can be a type stateful firewall, next generation, QoS, general application, traffic steering, service chaining, and so on and so forth. And we have a common template which will be applied to all of the devices in your SAS infrastructure. So from the service templates, let's review the security day next generation firewall template. In here, we can define zones. We can define how those zones are going to be protected against malicious attacks, such as packet-based attacks of various types against the flooding, scanning, and so on and so forth, and then apply it to different zones, which we will define in here. We have the next generation firewall module. Uh, in the previous sections, we already went through a lot of details in here. We saw how the DDoS works. We saw how the decryption works uh, for SSL decryption and SSL inspection. We saw also policies for the deep packet inspection and uh, data loss prevention, cloud access security broker, and so on and so forth. Uh, but one thing which was shown in the previous section is that authentication of the users was happening through the remote SASE client. In case when we connect in using SASE client, we already know what is the username and password of the people who are actually connecting to our network. And we can create rules. For example, you can go and create rules based on certain usernames of the users which are connecting to your network. But what if it's an edge deployment? like your office or the data center where you don't know, where you don't have clients installed on those machines or those servers. How do we authenticate them? For this, we have authentication section where we can define authentication policies, where we can say that, for example, we want to authenticate, this will be a rule two, somebody who is coming from a specific zone or going to a specific zone, or maybe from specific address to specific address, or maybe we want to authenticate certain uh, URL categories when people are going to auctions or botnets or maybe dating sites and so on and so forth, maybe applications, or maybe we want to create a schedule when people need to be authenticated. And then we can define how they should be authenticated. Here we have an integration with, um, with the following uh, authentication providers. First of all, it can be Kerberos, it can be LDAP, it can be a SAML integration, uh, for example, with Okta or maybe Azure uh, SAML integration. It also can be a local database, which is configured on the VOS device, or it also can be a single sign-on integration, which we have in our system. Uh, single sign-on or so-called passive authentication, where the users are authenticated through the Active Directory, we can receive the message from the Active Directory through a specific agent, which will inform VOS device that this IP address corresponds to this specific user. And user will not even going to be prompted to do some kind of authentication. Anyway, for the sake of this demonstration, I have a rule uh, which defines that anybody who is going to the social networking sites should be authenticated using the local authentication. And it's already applied to the device, uh, which is called SASE device. So the topology that we're going to be using for this demonstration is is in here. So we have a user, we have a security device, and we have internet to which this device is connected. So this user will try to go to a different website and we will see whether we will have or not have certain restrictions. Um, so let's log in. Okay, if we're gonna go to any of the websites, let's say yahoo.com. 
we're going without any problems and everything is open. But if we will try to go to any of this social networking, for example, facebook.com, we are redirected to the authentication. Uh, in this case, it's going to be authenticated using our local database. And once again, this is not authentication to the Facebook. This is local database through which we need to authenticate. So if I'm going to provide my credentials, such as Matthew and validate myself. And then if next generation firewall allows me access to that resource, this is going to be allowed. So for example, you can create your rules for the marketing department, which needs to have access to the social media to do advertisement. But maybe some engineering department doesn't have to have this access and they would need to be restricted. So, and this is the authentication, which is available for your on-premise SASE deployments. Further to the policy questions I was asking, um, Policies can tend to get pretty complicated. Um, you know, you can land in policy hell uh, pretty quickly if you've got a, a few team members doing things differently. Is, is that part of the configuration also available through NetConf and Yang and, and things like oh. that? So you can use software development methodologies and infrastructure as code methodologies to try and um, rein in some of that, uh, those problems? Actually, thank you for this question because that's something that I think I should have brought up initially. One of the differentiators of Versa that everything that you see that was done in the GUI can also be done using REST API. Absolutely everything. And in fact, the GUI front end is using REST API to communicate with the back end. So every single operation, every view, every addition, every kind of modification and everything else is done using REST API. And this is supported for you right now. That's even better than uh, NetConf and, and Yang. Perfect. Yes. Yes. Um, I have uh, a question Net as well. Um, yeah. Does does the branch have the ability? I know that there was some conversation earlier around policies and user identification and kind of single sign on and so forth. Does that policy, rather than flagging the user and re requesting um, that they enter credentials, is there any way that there would be connectivity directly from the Versa gateway to some other identif identity um, source or store that you would know essentially that the user was who they said they were before they attempted to hit the site so that you wouldn't have to prompt them to re enter credentials? Does yes. my question make sense? Yes, yes, yes. This makes sense. So we have integration with the Active Directory uh, using the single sign-on. So whenever user logs into their domain, this information is going to be retrieved from the domain controller, and we will know that this user corresponds to this API address, and therefore we will know that this is exactly this username which is coming from there. So they don't need to authenticate once again for this. I got you. And so in that particular use case, you could potentially know that the um, the individual that was attempting to reach Facebook was, in fact, a member of the marketing team. Exactly. exactly. And we don't need to provide any additional uh, authentication. And by the way, yeah. I'm going to give to add <laughs> yeah. so to I'll, security yeah. architect. Sure. Yeah. Thanks, Matthew. Uh, so yeah, I'd like to add that uh, yeah, we have a, a Versa messaging server, which is also one of our head-end components. It's kind of the real-time message bus for the overall Versa solution and deployment. So we have in integration with uh, other third-party components such as, uh, you know, Cisco PX Grid and Parallel Auto Pan Panorama. So for every authentication mechanism, whether it be device authentication or user authentication, you know, we can integrate with any third party, like any other infrastructure, like identity provider system in the network. And we don't need to reinforce that authentication again. So we can actually learn from the existing like uh, NAC infrastructure through the PX grid and like, you know, then associate those security group tags to the devices. And then the sessions actually carry forward those tags over the overlay network to any part of the network segment. And we can apply policies based on those uh, security group tags anywhere in the infrastructure. Likewise, even for user authentication, so whether it be like, um, you know, coming from like a firewall or a VPN or like any identity provider such as like, um, you know, Palo Alto, Panorama or, you know, any force cloud or, you know, we can actually ingest all of those feeds and in real time, we propagate to our uh, Versa messaging server to all of our uh, security gateways, branches, appliances, and we can apply you know, user group policies without actually reinforcing any kind of authentication to the user. Uh, we can also like selectively like step up the authentication whenever it's needed. So next step we want to talk uh, in this section is the evolution of the branch and the single pass architecture. 
If I'm going to review how networks were built or actually edge services like 10, maybe 15 years ago, companies had to purchase separately routers, security appliances, web optimization devices, switches, Wi-Fi devices, LTE modems, and so on and so forth. While now with introduction of the SD-WAN and single pass architecture, we can replace all of that with a single device from Verse Networks. What this gives us, first of all, cost. It's super cost effective. Second, this gives us much faster parallel processing. In the legacy model, you had to have multiple hops which uh, each packet is traversing, like firewall, UTM, router, SD-WAN, WAN optimization, and so on and so forth. And there were a lot of repetitive operations, such as route lookups, QoS, T-packet inspection, and so on and so forth. So with the introduction with the single pass architecture, when all of these components are tied together, we can actually, first of all, decrease the CPU load, decrease the memory load, make it much faster processing and much more efficient because we are doing all the inspection in one single place, in one single run. Second, another thing which uh, we did optimization with is the way how we actually processing the traffic. So every time a packet comes into the system, if we don't have a session record for that specific packet or for that session, we will uh, we will put that packet through the list of the services, such as SD-WAN service, deep packet inspection, next generation firewall, UTM, and other services. And then after it went through all of those services, we're going to create a session record. So if the following packet from the same session will come and we know already what is the decision for that session, we don't have to use all those services again. So this means that the performance uh, impact of the single pass architecture or this optimization is minimal. And even if you will enable next generation firewall, DPI, and so on and so forth, it will be apps almost the same performance as if it was just a regular router. The last portion, which we'll discuss today, is the multi-tenancy in the Verse networks. Um, this is actually one of the very common examples which a lot of our financial institutions or financial customers are using. Uh, imagine a situation, a bank which has ATM network and has a Tellers network. They have uh, independent data centers or maybe the same data center, but one of the PCI DSS requirements is that each of these networks, especially ATM, should have completely different independent media. It should have either different routers or different encryption or different network, but anyway, it needs to be separated from anything else. With the introduction of the multi-tenancy of person networks, we are doing multi-tenancy not only on the management plane, but also on each of the individual devices. For example, we can run multiple instances of the SD-WAN engine on each physical device on the edge. And we can run DRFs which are attached to that specific control plane instance to build independent uh, as the event tunnel to the remote locations. So each of these tenants will run its own control plane, its own BGP inside. It will have its own routes inside. It will have its own encryption, which is known only to that tenant. This allows us and our customers to actually spend way less money and have much more flexibility. Because first of all, they have multi-tenancy not only on the management plane, but also they have multi-tenancy on the control plane such as different BGP, a different encryption for the control plane and multi-tenancy on the data plane between data centers. And it's all using the same devices, using the same media. And just a reminder that all this multi-tenant functionality is available on all of our devices, which are running on the Versa OS device, such as your Versa OS devices in the data centers, in the offices, in the cloud, such as in the Versa SASE cloud, all of these locations support multi-tenancy and separation of the control plane, management plane, and the data plane. Can you move back to the, the previous slide? Of course. Yeah. So uh, I see that here you have uh, uh, different tunnels per VRF. So is that, a, that what we have, the actual tunnel interfaces per VRF, or it's like a pa pass virtualization where you uh, have a tagging or some sort of labeling to to have that uh, kind of the feeling of the different uh, uh, the virtual overlay. Okay, I answered your question. 
to answer it, if it is different tenants or different SDN engines, those are going to be completely independent SDN tunnels, uh, IPsec tunnels with their independent SLA probes, which are related only for that specific tenant. But also you can have independent VRFs within the single tenant. For example, you can have up to 1,024 VRFs on a single device, which will belong to a single tenant. And then you will have only one tunnel between each of the branches and one set of uh, SLA probes. So this was just to uh, this slide was intended to underline the possibility to have those independent IPsec encryptions, which are going to be separate across tenants. And if one of them is going to get compromised for any reason, uh, I mean technically this should never happen. But anyway, even if this is something that will happen, the second tenant will remain intact and not compromised. Okay, thank you. Sure. This is Remington. I have a question about the path selection for the various tenants. I'm presuming the answer here is yes, but um, just to, to kind of ask that, can you control your uplinks and or the path selection associated with your um, uplinks for each of these so that you could prefer, say, using your private uh, circuits for your uh, ATM traffic and with the failover maybe to the internet or not failing over to a particular uplink if you wanted to avoid going yes. across the particular media? Yes, and you can do this not only per tenant, but also per VRF. So first of all, for each of the tenants, you can specify which underlay links should be used for that tenant. For example, if you have two or three different internet links, some MPLS network from one customer and MPLS uh, network from another customer, you can say that some internet links and this MPLS network should be used only for one tenant. And this internet links and this second MPLS network should be used for the second tenant only. This is the first separation. Uh, second, you can define different topologies. You can define different topologies per VRF. Some of them might have hub and spoke topologies. Some of them might be a full mesh. Some of them might be spoke, hub and spoke, and so on and so forth. So I don't know the answer to this question. Um, I'm just wondering if Versa has dug into different um, compliances around the world, like PCI uh, compliance. And in North America, there's something called NERC-SIP that works on the power utility and designate uh, what uh, mm -hmm. you know for I'm going to ask help from our chief like security okay. architect. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, like we have, uh, we have actually like a lot of uh, compliances in progress. We are already certified for ISO twenty seven thousand one. We are going through a SOC two PCI and uh, you know HIPAA audit right now. We expect to complete that by end of the year. So we have like set sites on other like uh, compliances like GDPR. We are already compliant. And, um, you know, we we have actually, like, a uh, plan to, you know, uh, get international, like, uh, certifications as well. Because being a security company, you know, we have to be compliant with all the standards, uh, regulatory requirements that are local or government regulations. So, we'll see a California Consumer Privacy Act or, uh, uh, you know, any kind of, like, uh, you know, local regulatory requirements, you know, we have, we, we, we'll be able to match it. And meet the requirements. So we we go through like stringent like security policies ourselves in our infrastructure, and um, we we actually like uh, enforce continuous compliance. Everything. 